628 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, March the 2nd, 2022 years, from something. In this briefs, I'm going to talk mostly about Dresden, the bombing of Dresden, why, some questions about it as far as why so many ethnic Germans were funneled into that city? <clears throat> why the bombing was necessary, if at all? Its impact and effects. A lot of there's there's a lot that I don't know. There's a lot of misinformation on Dresden, on the bombing of Dresden, how bad it was. And the enemies of Israel and Judah have gone out of their way to minimize what happened in Dresden in February of 1945. What happened for... Not years before, for centuries. Prior to that, and what's happened since, and I'm going to put on my my nerd glasses because these really do protect your eyes if you have to look at screens for a long time. So I'm not calling people who wear glasses nerds. Um, I've just I've never needed glasses. I still don't. So I think I look odd in my glasses the uh, the picture i actually put up for uh, this channel was funny i didn't even realize i was wearing my glasses because <laughs> if i'm if i'm doing a lot of screen work for a long time i, just, I guess i kind of just even forget they're there anyways doesn't matter so what i want to do is actually talk about this in context of the book that uh, Kurt Vonnegut wrote in the, let's see, I think it was published <clears throat> late 60s, early 70s. I don't want to scroll back. Let me see. I'm on page nine. Real quick, just, just for, you know, posterity. Yeah, it's published in 1972 by Panther, Panther Books, LTD. Okay, so a word about <clears throat> Slaughterhouse Number 5. Slaughterhouse Number 5, in my opinion, I'm going to adjust this camera. In my opinion, Slaughterhouse Number 5 was and is one of the most important and maybe one of the best works all around in American literature in the last century. Now, yeah, I am saying that from a perspective of somebody who hasn't read nearly the amount of books written in the last century as others have. I've read a lot. I've read a lot, but... Yeah, there's many others out there, far better read than me. However, um, now I read this book at least a good 20 or more years ago when I knew nothing about all of this, other than maybe, you know, what I was taught in school or, or on the History Channel, popular culture. So, of course, the Germans were the baddies. And... Funny thing is, thinking in that way, being raised with that mindset, being programmed about the Germans being the bad guys, and of course, uh, the Irish are the bad guys too, even though we, we absolutely know that their country was decimated uh, in a number of, uh, now, looking back, deliberate uh, attacks on them, the Irish and the Celts uh, in general. 
But, you know, there's still, it doesn't stop them from being demonized in, in popular movies such as Gangs of New York and so on. <clears throat> Anyways, so the Germans, or Judahites, I had, by this time, been inundated with pop culture material, books, articles, of course movies, Indiana Jones, um, I, I couldn't even really think up all of the movies. I mean, Casablanca, um, you name it, Germans, bad guys, Hogan's Heroes. And even though I, I had been so programmed to, to believe that when I read this book, it had such an impact on me at the time. I don't think, I, this was, uh, I believe, the first, really the first book that Vonnegut po got published. I don't think anything he wrote after this was anywhere near, I don't want to say quality, had this, this sort of mental, emotional impact after this that slaughterhouse number five did and it's not because he wasn't good at what he did you know vonnegut was a was sort of an odd fiction writer but he did base his fictions on facts i mean his books were nearly allegorical there were certainly a lot of euphemisms i mean he was always looking at something that was of maybe a lot bigger importance in his books, like Cat's Cradle. Now, I did read also after this, I did read Cat's Cradle, and I did try reading, because I didn't get through them, I did try reading Galapagos and, um, I, yeah, Breakfast of Champions, I'm pretty sure. And neither one of those did I, I get through, just because I, I kind of lost, I kind of lost interest because they did not have, and neither did Cat's Cradle, in my opinion, the sort of impact, the sort of emotional and mental impact that you get from Slaughterhouse Five. And Slaughterhouse Five, it's not a long book. In, in the PDF that I have, which are, they're basically like, eight and a half by 11 pages with what looks to be like 12 point times uh, font. Really big margins, like one inch margins, and it's still 97 pages, not a long book. Not a long book. But what he does in those, in this case, 97 pages is pretty phenomenal. For those of you who haven't read it, okay, again, qualifies, they say, as science fiction, but of course, it is, it's based on Vonnegut's actual experience, his eyewitnessing the bombing of Dresden. So Vonnegut was there. Vonnegut, his main character in Slaughterhouse Number 5 is a guy named Billy Pilgrim. Billy Pilgrim is a an approximate of, of Vonnegut. Of course, some things are changed. Um, but yeah, Vonnegut was there. Vonnegut was taken prisoner by the Germans late in the war. I think late 44 he got captured. And so he was there in February when Dresden was bombed. He he didn't, I don't believe Vonnegut physically saw the bombing because he, he ended up having to be in shelters, um, like Pilgrim's character. And these shelters were actually outside the city proper. So, lucky for him, he survived it. What was so weighty in my opinion, about the book, was he writes it. He writes it about this character, Billy Pilgrim, 
The first lines of the story are, listen, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. The theme running throughout the book is this idea that this this man, Billy Pilgrim, has just, not by anything he's done, but he has this unfortunate condition wherein he can't maintain a consistency on the timeline of his life. Most of it, most of the book, the, the bulk of the book, is uh, him phasing between a few significant points in Billy's life. Um, one of them being his after-war life, where he gets married, has children, seeks a career in optometry, and so forth. Another one is where he is abducted by aliens called Tralfamadorians and taken to their planet of Tralfamador and kept in essentially a zoo. And with, of course, a, a very pretty, not too smart Hollywood actress where he gets to, I guess, live out his adolescent fantasies um, of sex with her, you know, for, I, I suppose, the remainder of his life. And then the third significant portion of the um, events that he keeps teleporting in time to are the events of him being captured in the war, taken to a camp near Dresden, housed there uh, in what was a slaughterhouse, thus the name of the book, Slaughterhouse Five, and witnessing the bombing, the all-out horrific unbelievable bombing of purely civilian population in Dresden, a city that was overfilled with refugees at the time. What even 20 years ago when I knew, well, I wouldn't say knew nothing, but was full of the, the anti-German propaganda, that struck me even then is the way that he wrote it because this character had come unstuck in time the fact is all this character kept doing it seemed as like the central point that he would keep phasing to throughout his life he would visit Sometimes his birth, he might pop over to his his death, and Vonnegut, of course, has this interesting um, viewpoint on death in here, and I think a lot of it relates to Dresden, and what he saw in Dresden. But he keeps going back to Dresden. That is sort of the central point of these time phases of his. And I very much think that what he's saying there by doing this is that no matter what else has transpired in his life significant things i mean even if say you know you uh, there was a billy pilgrim and he had been taken off to another planet and, and kept in a a sort of very very comfortable zoo uh, enclosure with this uh this extremely beautiful girl where he just gets to live out his his adolescent sex fantasies for the rest of his life uh no matter what he keeps going back to dresden he keeps going back to dresden because it's so central it had such an impact the horror of what he witnessed was so profound vonnegut not Pilgrim. Pilgrim's reaction to all of it is, it's different than Vonnegut's. But I don't think Vonnegut can even help but have that bleed through really badly. And, and the thing is, Vonnegut, if you, if you watch interviews with him or listen to them, um, he's not necessarily the, the, 
he doesn't strike me as really the most compassionate guy. I mean, you know, I, I think this guy is basically... I just don't see that he's very much, let's say, like myself. Um, his mindset's very, again, adolescent. Um, you read his books. I mean, really, strangely enough, for somebody with the intellect that he has, I mean, just sort of like dick and fart humor, in a sense. Um... So, <clears throat> it's interesting that it affected him so, so strongly that he had to essentially use this sort of story, this sort of format, as a coping mechanism. The Trial Famidorians and what they teach him about what time is, what life is, what death is, a coping mechanism. The whole thing is very much a coping mechanism to try to deal with how horrible it was for him to see countless people. They have tried to reduce the number in official figures of who was in Dresden when it was bombed for days. They've tried to reduce that number to like 30 thousand, thirty-five thousand, which is, it's insane. Vonnegut witnessed far more people there before a lot more refugees had come in. He said the city was already very full, very busy city. This was a very large city. The population at the time that he arrived there was about six to seven hundred thousand and they took in far, far, far more refugees. It's absolutely reasonable to believe there were far over a million there when it was bombed. And the way the Allies went about bombing the place was inexcusable. It was absolutely inexcusable. The, the people who say it was a necessity are complete liars. They are bald-faced, unashamed liars. It was, not a, it was not a necessity to bomb that civilian population. Because that civilian population wasn't making war. The NSDAP leaders, the soldiers, the army, they were making war. The civilians were not making war. Absolutely flies in the face of the Geneva Convention. They have to this day no excuse. The men who ran those, those bombing missions, who took orders and carried out those orders to drop those bombs, firebombing that place in the way that they did for days, have no excuse. War as hell is not an excuse. So I, I have a page I'm going to look at, too, that talks about Dresden before and after, because there's more to it than just killing that many ethnic Germans, thus Judahites, Israelites in general, but also destroying a city so old, so absolutely full of high culture, in architecture, in literature, in art. Some really inexplicable things that have nothing to do with just winning a war. By this point in time, the Allies were already turning the tides pretty well. There's no necessity to bombing this place and all those people, civilians. They didn't have any kind of, of real military presence there at all. And Vonnegut describes what military were even left there that they could spare. Grandfathers and little boys.
Now, I'm going to go through <coughs> some highlights in this book, Slaughterhouse-Five, mostly having to do, of course, with, with Dresden. And then I have a page up that has um, a number of, of pictures and a little bit of information on what Dresden looked like before this and how bad the damage was. Do you know that they specifically engineered? Uh, there was a guy, uh, his name was Harris. He was uh, sort of the head of, of the whole campaign, the bombing campaign. He was uh, Air Marshal Harris of uh, the UK. Harris. Harris is an important surname that I've tracked to a number of uh, dubious folks. Anyways. So he planned it out to where the bombing would happen in a, a carpet style uh, throughout the city, mostly concentrated on the cultural area of the city. And then what they would do is they would actually give the whole thing a couple, they would give everybody a couple hours space and then come back for another one. And the reason they were doing it in that way was deliberate so that people would come out of where they were hiding uh, emergency people like fire uh, firefighters, um, uh, emergency medical people coming to help they would all gather in the areas that were bombed because they're trying to help the people who were in those areas. And then once they're there to try to help people out, people are coming out a bit and all that, then they came with the next wave of bombing. And that's how they did it for a couple of days. It was an act of unspeakable aggression. Well, let's say unspeakable, unspeakable horrors, unmistakable, brutal, murderous aggression. I highly recommend, if you have time to read a, a fiction book based on a very real traumatic fact of history, and what you're getting here is you're getting an eyewitness account. Even though he's using this fictional character, Billy Pilgrim, a lot of it is specifically Vonnegut, eyewitness. Now, in his prologue, he's actually talking about the time leading up to really putting the finished product of this book together and getting it published. And at one point, he mentions this. It's on page, on the PDF, it's page 9. I don't have any other numbers here. He says, or he writes, I wrote the Air Force back then, asking for details about the raid on Dresden. Who ordered it? How many planes did it? Why they did it? What desirable results there had been, and so on. I was answered by a man who, like myself, was in public relations. He said that he was sorry, but the information was top secret still. I read the letter out loud to my wife and said, Secret? My God, from whom? Now, I have an answer for Vonnegut in the My God, from whom? From whom is from the people who the governments of the world make war on? From whom is specifically all the ethnic so-called Germans, but in reality, Judahites and Israelites, the ethnic Celts, the ethnic Germans, that these empires are making war on? That's the war. There is no war between this country and that country. Countries, countries' names, countries' borders... Um, identification through a nationality, patriotism, or religion is all a sham. It's all a smokescreen. It's bullshit. There are tribes. There are peoples. There are ethnicities. And they are at odds. That's the truth. My God from whom? from the people directly related to all those people your government murdered. That's who. Mm. One thing, I am going to read this little quote because it's 
It's significant to the before part of World War II. People make a brutal error in isolating World War II because they make, I, in my opinion, they make uh, tragic errors concerning uh, the people involved, their motives, and that's leadership, and that's on both sides, and that's what this was meant to accomplish. They're making terrible errors when they isolate it. Anyways, he's, this is one quote concerning uh, something he was reading. This is still part of the prologue. He says on page 12, McKay told us that the Children's Crusade, which I've mentioned before, started in 1213. Is that date correct or not? Mm. I don't know. But this is a good illustration of what have been the sorts of programs that have been implemented by the governments of Europe and America against ethnic Germans and Celts, Judahites, Israelites. He told us that the Children's Crusade started in 1213, when two monks got the idea of raising armies of children in Germany and France and selling them in North Africa as slaves. 30,000 children volunteered, thinking that they were going to Palestine. They were no doubt idle and deserted children who generally swarm in great cities. That's exactly the kind of propaganda they used to justify the orphan trains in the United States. Continuing, nurtured on vice and daring, propaganda, said McKay, and ready for anything more propaganda. Pope Innocent III thought that they were going to Palestine, too, and he was thrilled. These children are awake while we are asleep, he said. Most of the children were shipped out of Marseille, and about half of them drown in shipwrecks. Wow, that is just a huge amount of ships to be wrecked. How strange is that? The other half got to North Africa, where they were sold to brown people who probably used most of them as very hard chattel slaves or sex objects. Because that's what typically happens to our people when they're sold to brown people. That's a fact. And believe me, it's not just them. Other whites, specifically the, the Sephardim in general, and I would imagine other tribes that are not Celtic or Germanic, do the same things in various different ways. The Sephardics uh, at their various plantations in the eastern part of the United States a few centuries ago, they had breeding programs, of course, where they would take these uh, very that certain blacks, mostly these mandingos, and um, essentially they would give them Celtic girls so that they would rape them, inseminate them, and create a breed of people who they thought would be far more docile but intelligent. And again, sounds just like what we're seeing today without as much um, overt, shameless rape going on. Now, some people might have noticed the France part of that and say, oh, the French must be the tribe of Reuben. Uh, no. Actually, there were a great number of Gauls or Celts living in France. In fact, there is a peninsula off the northwest uh, corner or northwest area of France. Um, and I'm actually, I'm hand scrolling through this because I didn't want to just uh, put in Dresden to my search because I might actually pass up a few things like the last quote that I thought were still important. Anyways, there is that peninsula that was actually called Britannia and that was full of Celts off the northwest corner of France. When Asher carried away the northern kingdom. There's a description of where they brought them. And I have been saving this because I'm currently working on it, and it might take some time. But one of the most significant places they brought them was to the area uh, between basically 
southern France and northern Spain. Um, I believe that is why, for one thing, Portugal became such a major white slave trading port, slave trading port in general. Um, and then, of course, the other big one was uh, was Holland, and that's that's another story. So now the next quote is on page thirty. This is just this is a description of, of Dresden. Uh, after it was firebombed, and uh, Vonnegut described it in, in his eyewitness way, he said it looked like the surface of the moon because it was so desolate. They really did a number, and um, as I said, I'm going to scroll, scroll through these before and after photographs that I found of Dresden. Now, a lot of this... Um, material specifically on Dresden is a little bit later in the book which is why I'm having to do so much scrolling there is a lot of this book that has to do with like I said um, the Billy Pilgrim after the war his optometry is his family life there's time that he had to spend in the hospital next to this uh, complete douchebag like this military douchebag guy and um, and Tralfamador so uh, another highlight um, Billy had seen the greatest massacre in European history. This is how Vonnegut, the eyewitness to the bombing of Dresden, he called it the greatest massacre in European history, which was the firebombing of Dresden. <sighs> yeah. And they minimize it. And they minimize it. They literally have the gall to say that there were only about 35,000 people there, even if there were even if there were only 35,000 people there, they still went entirely against the Geneva Convention, which the Allies did from the start. And that's another point that needs to be uh, aired out, is the Allies were doing that from the start. They were bombing German cities, unprovoked, from the start. Civilian populations, from the start. And of course, that's going to beg a question. And the question being, why were German officials, those who were supposed to be in charge of or care about the welfare of Germans, why were they funneling them all into this great city, Dresden, knowing full well that the Allies had never spared bombing attacks on German civilians? Why are you concentrating them like that? Here's the... When Vonnegut got there, and I, I might actually read a quote that has this. I'm not sure if I highlighted it or not, but when he got there, he first off commented on how full the city was. A great city, large number of people, nearly a million. How full it was, A, and B, that they were living off like potato rations by then. Now, if, if this full city is already living off rations like that, why are you funneling so so many people in there. It's not as though there were great food stores there. And, and there weren't amazing shelters there either. Why were the German officials who were supposed to be on their side, these, the people that, you know, it's become very in vogue to lionize the NSDAP officials. Why were they hurting all these people in there, if not like sheep to a slaughter. Maybe there's more to this title than I thought. Uh, the next quote, page 55, I myself have seen the bodies of schoolgirls who were boiled alive in a water tower by my own countrymen. His own countrymen, that's important since I'm not quite sure that Vonnegut and I are of the same ethnicity, who were proud of fighting pure evil at the time. This was true. Billy saw the boiled bodies in Dresden. The boiled bodies, because they turned Dresden into a huge, horrific kiln. They cooked people. They boiled people. 
They roasted them alive. They infused people to anything that would melt in the city if they got caught in it. It was one of the, the most brutal acts of aggression in the last 100 years. And I'm, I'm trying to remember one other thing about that, too, speaking of. Yeah, it's something you have to keep in mind when I mentioned that I don't think Billy or Vonnegut is of my ethnicity. Well, first off, his the, the prefix, Von. Most Vons and Vans are tend to oftentimes be of a different class of people than my common people. Um, the other thing is, you know, Vonnegut, he supports real BS propaganda in here. You know, he literally says that, he says when they got to the camp, when he was taken captive by the Germans and treated really well, by the way. He was treated really well. The English soldiers they met up with were treated fantastically. They had far, far, far more food than any German civilian or soldier did. Now, how is that? How is that? that the German leaders were on the Germans' side, but they allowed these English to have so much more, these English soldiers and, and American soldiers that got there, so much more than their own soldiers and the people. Their own soldiers were were languishing so much that they would trade supplies to the English soldiers for various food, tobacco, liquor. They had so much. Now, Vonnegut chalks this up as, well, it was a clerical mistake on the part of the Red Cross. They were supposed to get 50 parcels of yada yada, but they got 500 per. But he never backs that up as a fact. I'm really not sure how anyone can justify that. Look, you give them enough, and you take the rest of it, and you give it to your people who are starving. I would really not care what kind of protestation there was from the Red Cross. People are starving. If they're the Red Cross, they would care. Why were the Allies allowed to hoard so much food and tobacco and liquor and other things in the face of so many ethnic Germans starving. And of course he says that when they got to that camp they were given candles and soap that were made from the fat of, and you know how that garbage that has absolutely been disproven goes. You know how that goes. This is an interesting quote on page 62. It says, Billy switched on a floor lamp, the light from the single source through the Baroque detailing of Montana's body into sharp relief. Billy was reminded, now this is Billy on Sorry, on Tralfamador, but he, and now he's thinking back. Billy was reminded of fantastic architecture in Dresden before it was bombed. And that's my cue to go to thevintagenews.com. The article, Devastating Photos of Dresden Before and After the World War II Bombing. Up until today, I was not familiar with vintage news, and I'm going to have to look into it a little more because this is pretty stellar. I'm not sure how big these pictures will get. They do have a brief description at the top of the page. The bombing of Dresden was a British-American aerial bombing attack on the city of Dresden, the capital of German, the German state of Saxony, that took place during the Second World War in the European theater. Now, I thought what happened in theaters is plays, acts, not reality, not truth, plays. Germany would be forced to surrender three months later in four raids between the 13th and 15th of February 1945, 722 heavy bombers of the British 
Royal Air Force, and 527 of the United States Army Air Force dropped more than 3,900 tons of high-explosive bombs and incendiary devices on the city. The bombing and the resulting firestorm destroyed over 1,600 acres, or 6.5 square kilometers, of the city center. An estimated 22,700 to 25,000 people were killed. Bullshit. Now, you can, you can actually reference um, David Irving and other sources concerning how many people were more likely there and how they have skewed these numbers. They've skewed these numbers in the sense of what bodies could be found and identified. Not the, the amount of people that were likely based on all available evidence actually there. That's how they're skewing these numbers. Three more USAAF air raids followed. Three more. Two occurring on the 2nd of March. The first two were the 13th and 15th of February. Three more air raids, two occurring on the 2nd of March. What was the point? Aimed at the city's railroad marshalling yard and one small raid. One more on the 17th of April aimed at industrial areas. Now, I wonder how many more Germans they, they were able to pack in there before they, they got those, those other two raids going. Immediate German propaganda claims, following the attacks and post-war discussions on whether the attacks were justified, have led to the bombing becoming one of major ca causes celebres of the war. Below you can see the before and after picture. Wait, immediate German propaganda? Like Germany had any kind of a, 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 a decent functioning propaganda machine at that point? German propaganda. You mean just plain leaked facts. So, I mean, obviously whoever is writing uh, for this vintage news is a bag of shit. There's no other way for me to say it, folks. I mean, if you're a snowflake, I'm sorry. So... This is the before, and these buildings and infrastructure of Dresden, they're just phenomenal. They're absolutely beautiful. And in, in a lot of ways, they would remind you of, I think, what a lot of people would try to point out and say is, I don't know, Eastern architecture or Tartar, Tartarian architecture even though nobody's been able to point out to me examples of this Tartarian architecture, culture, or civilization in the territories that were said to be Tartaria. Isn't it funny how close the word territory is to Tartaria? Tar Tartaria? I recently watched a film it was uh, by the same director who did the film Master and Commander, which wasn't a bad film, um, even with Russell Crowe in it. And um, it was it was about a few prisoners in um, in a gulag in Siberia who escaped from that gulag, and they traveled. This is supposed to be based on a true story. They traveled south, so they went through a uh, part of Siberia next to, uh, it's a huge moon-shaped lake uh, in Siberia, and the name escapes me, I'm so sorry, uh, to the border of Mongolia, through Mongolia, and then through the, um, the Gobi Desert, down into, you know, the area of, like, Nepal, uh, Tibet, over those mountains, uh, to that, that basin, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the basin that that forms south of the mountains. 
So that was their point was to get to India because they figured they couldn't go in any other direction or they would eventually be captured by Soviets. The interesting thing is is how desolate it was. Siberia, Mongolia, Gobi Desert, everything until you get to those mountains. You know, in fact, that part of Asia, <laughs> it's not bubbling with life. Most of your civilizations, your large cities in Asia, most of them, not all, but most of them are along the coast. But until you get to those mountains, and then you have India, and India is a very fertile, very large productive place more than the rest and you're trying to convince me there was the great empire there instead of it literally just being considered like on a lot of maps they will call it um, uh, maybe not parse incognita basically like you know huge nondescript territories but you know the um, the deliberately inserted buzz terms like Tartaria aside, this is Adamic architecture. Probably very specific maybe to certain tribes or sub-tribes. Maybe Hamitic, maybe Yephetic, or, you know, Japheth. His name was Yephath. Yephetic. Maybe Shemitic. but beautiful and really architecture that hasn't been repeated not that it can't be see I don't believe that that it couldn't be um, I really believe that the technology that we used to have that allowed us to do these things has really just been suppressed and hidden this is the point of the governments uh, having control over um, Patent offices, inventions, what they allow to be propagated, what they don't. I'm absolutely convinced that the internal combustion engine is not anywhere near uh, the most efficient way for us to utilize energy. And not, not, not the one that's using gas and what they call fossil fuels. But anyways really amazing stuff here really just fast fantastic stuff i'm not going to clip so much on the um the after pictures and i wish i could actually just scroll through these but i cannot but you can see how amazing these buildings are absolutely amazing i mean this city should have been a world heritage site They never should have considered bombing it. Now, what's in here besides all of this amazing, beautiful, old world architecture? And, and the, the details on the exteriors of these buildings in the granite, marble. It's just amazing. Out of this world. Stuff that they did not do with hammers and chisels. So what more was in that city besides, you know, Judahites, Israelites, and this amazing architecture? Likely, a lot of records, a lot of literature that they also wanted destroyed. A lot of art, of course. You know, New Earth had at least one video where she talked about these old famous paintings and how impossible it was uh, for them to be done because of how thin the paint actually was on the canvas. Because they were so brilliant. They're so brilliant, so detailed, magnificent works of art, and the paint is so thin on the canvas. Which, for anybody who's painted with oils or acrylics, that doesn't happen. When you paint with oils or acrylics, typically in a really organic way, you're going to get paintings that are more like your your Van Goghs. There's that name, Van. Um, your Cezans, Picassos. You're you're going to get you're going to get texture. You're going to get texture. 
um, Goyas, you're, you're not going to get these Rembrandt, Raphael, um, you're just not. They're so brilliant. They're so detailed. They're so amazing. And the paint is not built up like it ought to be. If it's done with oils or acrylics, you know, and that, in the way that it's the style that we're said that it was done in. Even Da Vinci's just brilliant paintings. So I think there was a lot in Dresden. There was genetics. There was evidence in architecture. And there were probably a lot in records too. Because, you know, churches would keep a lot of records, and those records would sometimes go back, and they would tell us a whole lot about people. Families of people, clans of people, tribes of people. We could learn a lot from them. There might have been a lot of records there that were actually, they're still there, who knows where they were kept. The Allies, I'm sure, did. And I'm sure the German officials did, too. Records that maybe weren't in the German spoke in Saxony at the time, and there were a lot of variations of German at this time. German became more and more uh, condensed into one language, especially after World War II. Records perhaps in Latin or Greek, since those two languages actually, if you take healthy doses of, of Greek and Latin and you take people that speak Obery and you force them to speak Greek for some time and then force them to speak Latin to a certain degree, they're going to develop a language called German. That's literally what German looks like, acts like, sounds like. Is Obery that has is spoken by a people that were also forced to speak some form of Greek and Latin too. It's just amazing, by the way, this, this architecture is it, 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 jaw-dropping. Now, if you can get past the obvious propaganda that, that this this site is, is, is using, I don't know why. Now, okay, so some of these they're not allowing me to click on. That's unfortunate. The after one. Here, here's a before. Wow, these are utterly amazing utterly amazing these beautiful large statues atop all the points in this building and I don't know if this was actually before because look a lot of this is demolished right in there you see all of that so I don't know about that oh look at these windows down here by the street look at those windows by the street it's a mud flood Yeah, anyway, so that's that's most of it. They were amazing. Look at pictures, um, if you can find pictures of old Vienna. It's an amazing city, Vienna. Dresden. Yeah. Look at all this work, the uh the, the detail ornament statue work all up here. And when you consider how large these pieces are. Because if you put someone on the ground down here and look at the size of them, look at the size of all of these. And if you got up there, you would see all of these detailed, beautiful, beautiful things. And I think that's one of the big things that they want to hide in the destruction of the past. I think at some point they realize that people like me and, and few others are, are going to ask questions like this. Okay. If you guys have the records and we had the ability to do all of these various things that we're talking about, then you guys are deliberately keeping all of this from us. This would include advanced uh, medical procedures and techniques, advanced understanding of the body and nutrition. As a matter of fact, I believe that things like 
uh, photography, cameras, um, moving pictures, film cameras are not a new thing whatsoever, and they go back many, many centuries. They aren't rocket science. Cameras, they're not rocket science. No, they're not a, a simple child's play toy, but they're not the the complex things that I, I'm sure they would like us to believe that they actually are, because we were obviously so stupid that we didn't invent this again until the 1800s, which is really just the time that they either had to use a certain amount of technology or they couldn't necessarily suppress that technology. It was out there, and so the stories began to be crafted. This was invented by a so-and-so Smith in 1842. And wouldn't you know it, we have photographs of American presidents from 1850 that are just as sharp as you could want. Maybe that's why so many people struggle with this idea of photographs of these amazing old buildings. They see these photographs of it being so-called constructed, right? I don't know. And they say, well, that these are just photographs of them deconstructing this building. They took photographs of them deconstructing it and, you know. Maybe, just depending on what stage it's in, Maybe. But I don't know if that always holds water. I think, in my mind, a far more reasonable um, alternative to that sort of excuse for why they may have pictures or films of certain things is that we've had cameras going back as far as we could build. Look, look, these things aren't new. Look, we could build structures like this with this high intensity, detail, and brilliance hundreds at least hundreds at least years ago, and we didn't have cameras. Moving pictures. We didn't have high quality, high pixel fine quality cameras really I think not much has been invented in fact in the last couple hundred years it's just that a certain amount of things couldn't be suppressed and everything that could be has been thus the burning of libraries the bombing out of cultural centers and so on and so forth this is the point. If you want a slave population, you must keep them stupid to a degree. Only train them to do what it is that you need them to do for your empire's sake and your tribe's sake. Only let them be smart enough to do that. Do not allow them to find out the truth. And that's why there's so many seeds of disinformation that have been out there for a long time. Started years ago in the, the whole realm of YouTube, social media, um, internet. But it's been around for a hell of a long time before that. Okay, and that's just its, its most current incarnation. Take the focus away from the real great empire and empires of the old world heavily concentrated in North America. You got a bit in South America, Europe, the eastern, far eastern coast of Asia and India, all being white. Take the, the focus away from that and start telling people all kinds of fantasies that they'll believe because they want to believe it. The reason people believe all of these Tartaria, Mud Flood uh, stories with no real teeth, no real substance or evidence, is because they want to believe them. 
this is this is actually one of the quotes the um okay so when billy pilgrim is there they get to this they're going to be housed in a slaughterhouse okay slaughterhouse five someone says to him you needn't worry about bombs by the way dresden is an open city it is undefended and contains no war industries or troop concentrations of any importance. He goes on on the same page to say Derby was imagining letters to home, his lips working tremendously or tremulously. Dear Margaret, we are leaving for Dresden today. Don't worry. It will never be bombed. It is an open city. There was an election at noon and guess what and so on. Furthermore, he writes, the trip to Dresden was a lark. It took only two hours. Shriveled little bellies were full. Sunlight and cold air came in through the ventilators. There were plenty of smokes from the Englishmen. Yes, because the Englishmen had shitloads while the Germans had very little to nothing. The Americans arrived in Dresden at five in the afternoon. The boxcar doors were opened and the doorways framed the loveliest city that most of the Americans had ever seen. The skyline was intricate and voluptuous and enchanted and absurd. It looked like a Sunday school picture of heaven to Billy Pilgrim. Every other big city in Germany had been bombed and burned ferociously. That point is important. If every other city in Germany had been bombed and burned ferociously. Why were the Germans funneling so many people from all over that area of Saxony to Dresden, knowing that the Allies were doing that? Dresden had not suffered so much as a cracked window pane. Sirens went off every day, screamed like hell. The people went down into cellars and listened to radios there. The planes were always bound for some place else. Leipzig, Chemnitz, Plauen, places like that. Eight Dresdeners crossed the steel spaghetti of the railroad yard. They were wearing new uniforms. They had been sworn into the army the day before. They were boys and men past middle age, and two veterans who had been shot to pieces in Russia. Their assignment was to guard 100 American prisoners of war who would work as contract labor. A grandfather and his grandson were in the squad. The grandfather was an architect. Thousands of people were on the sidewalks going home from work. They were, they were watery and putty-colored, having eaten mostly potatoes during the past two years. Again, what was in Dresden to funnel so many people from all the outlying towns there? He goes on, page 70. He was enchanted by the architecture of the city. Mary Amoretti wove garlands above windows, roguish fawns and naked nymphs peeked down at Billy from festooned cornices. Stone monkeys frisked among scrolls and seashells and bamboo. These buildings were so marvelously decorated. In stone. In marble. Beautiful work. I can imagine what they looked like on the inside. The plaster work. The coffered ceilings. The wood the marble, the glasswork. The slaughterhouse wasn't a busy place anymore. Almost all the hooved animals in Germany had been killed and eaten and excreted by human beings, mostly soldiers. 71. Speaking of people from Poland, Billy Pilgrim accidentally saw a pole hanged in public about three days after Billy got to Dresden. This is another one of Vonnegut's little sad story against the Germans kind of thing. Billy just happened to be walking to work with some others shortly after sunrise, and they came to a gallows and a small crowd in front of a soccer stadium. The pole was a farm laborer who was being hanged for having sexual intercourse with a German woman. Good for them. 
we do have to protect our women and our seed line, by the way, entirely justified. Now, let's, let's do something in contrast to, to Vonnegut here, because he does do a lot of bleeding heart anti-German bullshit in here, by the way. How about this? If you watch some of the documentaries, I don't know if I can link them or not without it just throwing off million red flags. If you join my Obery Project Panoply, I have linked one or two of them in on the wall in there. Um, there is one specifically all about Dresden from people who survived it. And there was a girl, she was talking about actually being there and she had come out. She had come out after one of the air raids to see what there was to see and who there may be and to look for people. And she said when she came out, there was a bank around the corner where she was standing. And she said that one of the first things she saw was a man walking around from where that bank was with a small suitcase in his hand. And she says he was, he was jovial. He was uh, sort of laughing. And he came up to her. And he looked at her, and I believe she said she asked him why he laughed. And he said to her, We Poles, we Poles and the Czechs knew this bombing was going to happen. And it's going to happen again. So Vonnegut's not going to move me whatsoever with a story of a man who was hired as a farm laborer and having sex with an ethnic so-called German Judahite, Israelite. And you can just fill in the blanks to why I'm not even remotely moved about that and why I think they were absolutely justified in what they did. There wasn't a kitchen in there, he says on page 73. There was a dressing room adjacent to a com communal shower. There was a lot of steam. In the steam were about 30 teenage girls with no clothes on. They were German refugees from Breslau, which had been tremendously bombed. They had just arrived in Dresden, too. Dresden was jammed with refugees were jammed with refugees and this was a city that was known to have a population of six to seven hundred thousand before and during the war and we'll see if there's too many more quotes from this that are are important for what we're talking about uh, he spoke of the brotherhood between the american and the russian people and how those two nations were going to crush the disease of Nazism, which really all they crushed was the German people, so-called Judah, which wanted to infect the whole world with, and what they wanted to affect the whole world with was not being um, screwed, uh, enslaved, sold off, killed, separated, mothers from children, mothers from fathers, fathers from children, that's what the people wanted. You can't infect the world with that. Not this world. The air raid sirens of Dresden howled mournfully. Howard W. Campbell Jr. remained standing like the guards. He talked to the guards in excellent German. He had written most uh, many popular German plays and poems in his time and had married a famous German actress named Resi North. I have no idea why I highlighted that. It was an next night about 130,000 people in Dresden would die. The next night, he said about 130,000 people. This is an eyewitness. And he pegged it at 130,000 would die the next night. The next night. How many times did they say it was bombed? Well, let's see. It was bombed over two days, a number of times. And then, again, in about two or three weeks. And then, less than a month after that, it was bombed again. How many, how many people you think died? And did the uh, German officials just keep sending people there so that more and more Judahites would die. Man, 
I don't know. Vonnegut does go on to describe what he was able to hear from the bomb shelter and then what he was able to see uh, afterward. Um, he did see various portions of, of some bombing. Um, and I mean, the, 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 the descriptions, they are really terrible. Um, nah, I'm sorry. I was just seeing if there was anything that was going to, to drive home the point. Um, probably not. I'm sorry, probably not. Okay, so this is just over an hour, and I really wanted to talk about just some of those issues. If you have the extra time, and you know you like fiction based on fantasy, Slaughterhouse Number no. Five, yeah, you could do a lot worse reading than than that. But um, it's just some things to consider. So I'll see you next time.